the ensemble became very well known. They started to tour, and that Jones was cranking out, you know, arrangements for this specific ensemble. Um, what's really unique to me is a lot of these individuals came out of like the Count Basie Jazz Orchestra or the Stan Canton Orchestra and formed this more modern band. And I say more modern, we're not very many years re removed, but when you think about the generational gaps we have all the time, they were kind of that younger generation playing with Kenton and Basie, now creating their ensemble. Um, so when I look at jazz history, when I think about jazz history, I you see that progression, kind of that evolution, going all the way back to the swing era of the late 20s, you know, something that Benny Goodman's doing, going from a small ensemble to his large group, and Duke Ellington, and Count Basie, and then how, how did these bands uh, survive, or how do they thrive over time? Some of them fold because of economic times. Some of them start touring smaller, Hampton and his band, the different sizes. Um, just, it's very interesting to see that historically, with the you know, economic times, the music changing, and popularity, just seeing how those bands, the big band, approximately 20 players, sometimes would go down to a smaller group. I mean, Lionel Hampton even had his small groups versus large groups. But the Vanguard does a very, um, Vanguard Jazz Orchestra, or, or at the time, the Thad Jones and Mel Lewis Orchestra, um, they do very well as a large ensemble. More individuals you have there, more it costs to travel, more it costs to get those individuals paid. Um, and they do very well um, all the way 70s, 80s, and uh, eventually, uh, Great composer joins them, Bob Brookmeyer, and they start seeing a very, uh, I want to say contemporary, but that word sometimes gets lost in how it's used, but an updated aspect of where the music is going for the uh, composing and arranging. And this band very much takes on its own moniker and sound. Um, me as a jazz musician in grad school, we would have a semester where we just played that Jones and Mel Lewis music. Other semesters, we would look at just Count Basie music. And so it's very much part of the jazz education um, repertoire, so to speak, and very difficult music. Um, very much expanding on the tradition of what uh, what was brought before those, you know, what Count Basie brought to the table with Duke Ellington, taking those and doing their version of it. But incredible compositions. And that band continued to be, so quote unquote, that reading band every Monday night, and to this day, you can still catch them um, in the village, Village Vanguard in New York City on Mondays. And so, if you've ever been there, it's very intimate. It's very small, and you can't believe that the whole band gets on the stage. Um, but I highly recommend it. Um, it's a, if you're ever in New York City, go, go to the Village Vanguard and check out the Vanguard Jazz Orchestra. Um, but we're lucky to have this ensemble here. Um, they don't tour often. When they do, it's just great to get them. Um, and uh, so that's going to be our opening that evening. And again, during intermission, we'll have an opportunity to hear from those outstanding instrumental soloists that are selected. Um, and it just happens to be high school that day. And they'll, the high school students will have an opportunity to uh, be selected for that business scholarship through the School of Music as well. Um, and closing is going to be very unique. So if you, since we've all been there, you've probably seen the Lionel Hampton Big Band in some form or another in the last 20 years. Whether you saw him with Lionel Hampton himself leading the band, or one of the iterations that we've had over the last decade, what's going to be very unique this time is, well, let me back up and give you a little bit of history. Often, um, and I remember pretty, just very vividly, when I was an undergrad student coming up, um, I remember just the energy and the power that that ensemble brought, and just the joy that Lionel Hampton and, and Wally Gator and some of his, the personalities in his musician really brought. Uh, it was very unique. Um, and there was always sometimes a supplement to that ensemble. And the supplement being 
sometimes the uh, trumpet professor at the university would sit in with that section and play. Um, from Bob McCurdy, you know, going back many years to Bird Sealert. Um, and then sometimes the Gimberling brothers would sit in with that ensemble as well. So sometimes they've been supplemented um, at the choice of whether it was Hampton or the Hampton Estate to have some of the uh, local musicians that are at the same level play with them. What's unique this year is the, they've been rebranded in a slight way called the New Line Hampton Big Band. And what this was is this was a project thought up by the bassist and Jason Marsalis and uh, they approached the Lionel Hampton estate and said, hey, we're going to keep doing the Lionel Hampton Big Band, but we want to try to start uh, promoting some of the small ensemble music that Lionel was putting together. So Lionel actually toured with uh, and played, he had a book of music that was a little bit smaller instrumentation. It's still a big band, but not the 17 pieces. It was an 11-piece group. And it, that was a very common, there was very common to see instrumentation and, and music books, so to speak, put together for between 9 and 11 individuals. A little bit cheaper to tour, a little bit easier to get around the country when you think about going all the way back to 1940 through 70s, 80s. And that was very common for most band leaders. I and mean, Hampton had a book like that. So what Christian Fabian and Jason Marsalis did is they approached the estate and said, hey, we want to do this. So they kind of named it the new Lionel Hampton Big Band, featuring Jason Marsalis. Um, and then they're using a, a special guest um, vocalist, Antonia Bennett, Tony Bennett's daughter, happens to be. And they've been playing with this ensemble, kind of doing selective uh, performances throughout the United States. Um, and uh, so it's a very unique situation because we haven't had this ensemble or heard this particular group of uh, arrangements before at the festival. Um, unfortunately, Jason was originally supposed to be with this, um, but is not going to be. Um, he is with his brother doing a jazz at the Lincoln Center tour, I think in Europe this week. And so we lost him, but we have an incredible replacement, Joseph Doubleday. We had Joseph here for our 50th anniversary two years ago, um, recreating some of the Hamp small group. Uh, we did kind of a uh, then and now, where we had two groups on stage playing the original arrangements and then some modernized versions of it. So Joseph has been here, he's a very incredible musician, um, so he's very aware of the Hamp tradition. That we're honored to have him. And then uh, Antonio Bennett will be singing with that ensemble as well. So I'm super excited to hear him because I haven't heard this group in that particular setting. Um, and uh, so a lot of information I've given you and thrown at you. Um, I'm happy to answer questions that you have. Um, I, want, I briefly want to talk about some of the things that I see you doing next year um, and kind of moving forward, but I, I can take a pause if there are questions. I have one quick question. Sure. Do you still have all of your opportunities open for people? That's what I was going to get to next. Was it a paper that I asked you to volunteer? Oh, okay. <laughs> so, I looked your... online and did not see it. <laughs> well, you got to go to the print journalism. That comes in the evening when I get home. <laughs> Absolutely. If you go to our website, um, if you click on the tab, one of the uh, drop-down items is volunteer. We're absolutely looking for volunteers from driving around our artists, our adjudicators, those guests that we're bringing into town, to um, helping with our site managing, to helping with workshops, just all the things I described. We have a huge volunteer team. The beautiful thing about volunteering is if you volunteer for a shift of four hours, you get a ticket to come to see one of the shows. I have to go to another meeting. Can I have two of your posters? You can have that or share. Thanks. Because I have to be elsewhere at one o'clock. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, but those volunteer opportunities are very, uh, very diverse, and we would definitely put you in a situation that you're comfortable with. We have volunteer opportunities during festival and before festival. Um, everything from just helping us stuff holders and kind of like swag bags for our uh, directors that are coming in with a lot of great information about the community from the Chamber of Commerce to the University to uh, local entities doing uh, 
you know, pancake breakfast on Saturday to feed all these kids. Um, so there's a lot of things that we get together for them. But uh, the more volunteers, uh, the smoother it runs. And again, the beautiful thing about that is if you're looking for a uh, discount away or a way to get into the concerts, a couple of shifts will get you into both concerts. So. Are some of the visiting musicians still going to outlying schools? Great question. So one thing that I didn't talk about very in depth was the Jazz in the Schools program. So a decision that was made before I got here um, was they spread jazz in the schools out over the school year. And instead of just being concentrated the week of, um, I'm going to reevaluate this and look at this um, for 2020. We've already actually sent out um, a couple of our artists in January um, to some of the surrounding schools. We're doing an outreach to all the schools. We sent out an email to anyone that has had jazz in the schools previously just saying, please let us know that you're interested, please update your contact information. And uh, we also were just communicating out that we kind of have this calendar year now. And one of the reasons why we're doing that is then when we bring a musician in to work with the School of Music during the year, we just kind of tag on, let's go visit some schools, do jazz in the schools. Um, that's going to be one of the things that we're going to look at and see how this is working as a year-round thing versus a week out. Um, but, uh, actual week of the festival, we do not have anyone going out uh, due to scheduling conflicts with our musicians coming in. So, but we sent some out uh, three, four weeks ago. We're about the middle of February, we're getting there. And then we'll be sending some out in April as well, March and April. So, yeah. Is there an office where we can go and see all the schedules and where we can volunteer on campus? Is there an office? So, the Jazz Festival office is located in what's called the Class Annex, so the College of Letter Arts and Social Science. It uh, sits on the corner of Sweet and Railroad, right across the street from the bus station. Okay. Um, the Jazz Festival. It's where the Forge Theater's at. It's where the Forge Theater's at. And I think it used to be an industrial tech building. Um, but uh, we're in room 17. We are typically there between 8 and 5. It tends to be later right now for me. Um, but the easiest thing to do if, uh, if you don't want to work your way over there first is just to fill out the form online and then we'll contact you, but you're always welcome to stop by. We always welcome guests there. Um, and the Friday and <clears throat> Saturday concerts are they in the dome? All the concerts really can be done. Okay. So, yep. 